Greetings everyone, it's Anya again, and I want to introduce you to someone who's going to really help us with our learning about plants and making careful observations. Um, this is someone, his name is Michael Holland, and he's written a wonderful book, I Ate Sunshine for Breakfast, which is a book for children and families, all full of wonderful information about plants and some activities and ideas. And we're going to use some of these from the book and some other things as well to add to our growing plants and our nature journals. Uh, so let's talk to Michael. I was really excited to talk to Michael about his new book, but first I wanted to ask him about the childhood experiences that were important in building his interest in nature. Well, I was very lucky that my parents were really green fingered. They loved nature. They did a lot of rambling um, throughout their childhoods, um, adult life and um, as parents. Um, they dragged us up mountains and through bogs and marshes and along the longest beach, because most of the time um, it was all within Britain. So I really got to know the land that I live in, which is, a, which is I really love them for that. I was very privileged in, in growing up in a very leafy part of North London, quite near to Hampstead Heath um, and various parks and woods. So, and we had a nice garden and I was encouraged as well. And at the age of eight, my parents bought for me, uh, my birthday present was a book by Keith Mossman called The Pip Book. Uh, which is just how to grow pips from the kitchen, things that you'd otherwise throw away, whether it's apples or pears or dates or kumquats or avocados or lemons. And, it, you know, I mean, I, I got very experimental, our airing cupboard on me. And I had a couple of school teachers who were inspirational. Uh, there was one particular one who saw that I didn't want to play football because I just wasn't very good at it. And it was so cold and I was miserable. And I was interested in the earthworms underneath the rocks and the bricks on the side of the football pitch. So he set me a, a project to find out as much as I could about earthworms instead of playing football. And that really helped me understand earthworms and a love, you know, brilliant animal. And Charles Darwin himself said it was one of the most incredible, important creatures ever to live on the planet Earth. Um, so really, you know, quite a significant creature. I'd like to come back to talking to Michael about Charles Darwin and especially earthworms later, but I also wanted to talk to him about Carl Linnaeus, a Swedish botanist, zoologist, and physician who lived over 200 years ago, but has made a huge impact on the way we study the natural world today. And of course, our mutual friend that you learned about in the last video, Daryl Stenville Wells is an education specialist at the Linnaean Society, and we'll have a chance to learn more about Linnaeus and also their wonderful natural history collections and field notebooks in future videos. Both Michael and I are trained in biology and natural history, and so from very early on, we learned to use the binomial taxonomic system to make sense of and understand the different kinds of living things that we were studying. So I wanted to ask Michael a little bit about how Linnaeus's work and his system informs the kinds of things that he studies today and the kind of education and outreach projects that he does, including his wonderful book. Other thing is he, he, he named so many organisms, fungi and um, plants and animals. And a lot of those names are still his, you know, named after him. And I think he's quite, um, I kind of like the idea of naming. Some people are saying, oh, why can't you just use a common name? But when you look at common names, there are hundreds of them. I mean, one plant, the plant we call daisy or Bellis perennis, that Linnaeus would have called it, there's, 50 common names just for the daisy in the UK. There's probably others all around Europe and wherever it grows. So it's very good to be specific. Um, and I like the idea that uh, Bellis perennis means forever beautiful. Um, it's a perennial plant too, so it's perennis for that, all that sort of stuff. And there are all these plant families and that whole idea, I think also makes the plant world more accessible because it, you realize that plants have got cousins and brothers and sisters just like we have. 
So Michael, that was wonderful. And I learned so much from you, this conversation. I wanted to ask you a little bit more about Linnaeus and the contributions that he's made by helping us uh, naming plants and understanding more about the plant kingdom. And you have a wonderful image in your book on the plant kingdom uh, and how the different plants are related to each other. Can you tell us a little bit more about how Linnaeus contributed to our understanding? Yeah, sure. So Carl Linnaeus contributed to a worldwide scientific system that everyone uses to this day um, in terms of how to sort living things into different groups, families, and into sort of smaller, smaller groups too, such as species. Um, and he was very sure of himself. He was very confident and he didn't give up. Um, and over 300 years later, we're still using the system, even when new species are being discovered, um, which helps us put them put them in the right in the right groups basically so it's it's a way of making sense of all of this diversity and he mm. came up with an organized way wonderful so um and, and i know you mentioned he went to lapland and so forth so can you talk a little bit about how he was able i mean there have been lots of people living on earth for a long time he he really contributed this major insight to coming up with this system. How did he go about doing that? Well, he obviously observed things very closely um, and he looked at um, the, at the time it was it, with plants anyway, it was, would have been the similarities of the flowering structures. Which is, um, nowadays, scientists can look at the genetic um, makeup of, of a plant and see what its sisters and brothers and cousins are to this day. But um, he would have looked at the flowers. So he, he kept lots of detailed um, information on his travels and his findings and would, be, would have been very careful about labeling where they were found and the date. I mean, he had, but this is, a, this is a very simple activity that anyone can do is to collect and press plants and flowers um, and have really nice, make your own, make your own collections. So another thing that I'd love to talk to you a little bit more about, and it, it kind of links a little to Linnaeus, because I know from what little I've read, even as a child, Linnaeus was fascinated by the natural world and he loved plants and he was really interested in them. And, and so I really, um, I can connect that with the wonderful story that you were telling about your parents giving you the book on on pips and growing and experimenting with all kinds of seeds and of course i mean look that's turned into this amazing career and it, same for linnaeus this fascination from when he was a child and he just followed it and ended up making this huge contribution to science that 300 years later were benefiting um but in your book in your book um that book was so so helpful to me because um your your pages on shelf life project and there's a lot, that's another thing I don't think we've mentioned, is that throughout your book, there are a whole bunch of ideas for hands-on investigations and experiments and things that you know kids can do at home. Here are some fun things you can grow from your cupboard. So just like when you were a kid and trying these different pips, and we did the same thing. And we tried, I happen to have here at home, uh, uh, some apples and some grapefruits and some lemons. And so I went ahead and, and tried those to grow. But then I read in your book for citrus seeds, it works much better if you cover the pot after you plant the seeds, cover it with cling film and you'll keep the moisture and you'll keep it warmer. And um, my grapefruit and lemon seeds hadn't started to sprout yet. And I read that and I went, aha. So I put cling film for a couple of weeks and uh, sure enough, so thanks to you, mm -hmm. I have some baby lemon plants and um, some baby grapefruit trees growing um, and they, they grew really well. So now in addition to, and I didn't do that with the apples and sure enough, the apple grew just fine. So it worked, it worked great. And thank you so much. Pleasure. I mean, for me, that, that project's great fun um, where you take things that would otherwise be thrown away from the kitchen and you know, raid the kitchen cupboard for seeds and spices and, and try and grow them. It's great fun. Um, there's a great joy there experimenting with this and seeing just things come come to life um, and even when things don't work to be honest which that's true that's what happens in life that's what happens when gardening it's it's a good lesson it's a good lesson just to kind of start again start all over again and just be patient 
um, and just keep trying. We're going to be doing going forward is giving you more ideas um, about how you can grow your own things and keeping your own nature journal so you can record your progress and your failures and your successes. I'm so excited, Michael. And so um, we'll just have to tell everybody, stay tuned, right? And in the next couple of weeks, we're going to have a bunch more videos uh, with some great ideas and, and some more uh, art projects and things from Daryl as well. So um, lots to look forward to. Thank you yeah. again. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm.